Yeah, no, that's, um, I, it sounds like you've got a, some really good uh, trip ideas set up already. So a little um, history of myself. Um, I uh, started working for Untours back in 92. And one of my first trips to, um, um, uh, for work was to Provence. And of course, this is the Pont du Gard because before France, there was Gaul and the Roman Empire. Uh, and back in those days, you can actually basically walk up and climb through the air holes. And I, in spite of my uh, fear of heights, I actually did that. I don't remember if I took any pictures, but uh, I could say it was a, an, uh, an exciting moment. But in any case, enough about me. I figured I'll pivot now to um, uh, France. Now, as you can see, France more or less is, um, it's about size of Texas, just a little smaller, uh, bordered obviously to the west um, by the Atlantic Ocean. You have the English Channel up here. You have the Pyrenees, which separates France from the Iberian Peninsula, Mediterranean Sea, the Alps to the east, and then the Rhine River, uh, which kind of basically forms a border with Germany, and you can see Luxembourg and Belgium here. Um, now, of course, one of the reasons for why going to France, it's history and culture. Uh, I know it's a little maybe cliche because everybody has probably seen Notre Dame. It's still one of my favorite buildings. It's still uh, sort of a masterpiece of uh, church and Gothic architecture, and it's well loved by the French. And of course, in its importance, you know it burned down, or at least the roof and the spire burned down in April 2019. Uh, and the one thing, one of the first things they saved or tried to save from the fire, which they did, was the alleged crown of thorns that Jesus Christ actually wore when he was crucified. So you can see that belies sort of the importance of Notre Dame as a cathedral and certainly for the French. Now, of course, part of French history is the monarchy that lasted for quite some uh, centuries. Uh, this one being a representative of Louis XIV, the Sun King, the longest serving monarch in France. But of course, the monarchy didn't last forever. You ended up having the French Revolution. Now, this particular painting is not representative of the first revolution, but in fact, the revolution of 1830, the second French Revolution, we call it. But I like showing it because one, it's one of France's most famous paintings. Uh, it was done by Eugène Delacroix, who happens to be one of France's famous, most famous artists, among many who left uh, an indelible mark, you could say, on French history. And of course, one of the reasons for France to go is the landscape. Now, this is specific to Provence, but it gives you an example of the sort of bounty of the land. Here you have vineyards, we have trees, and then you have mountains. Uh, this specifically is the Dantel de, de Montmirail uh, in France, one of the places you certainly visit if you went to Provence. Now, just to use this Google Earth to kind of give you another representation of the landscape, you can see we're looking at the Mediterranean north into Provence. Here is our general area in Provence. Uh, it's the town of the city of Avignon, uh, which is quite famous, well-touristed. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, there's a papal palace there, mostly because there, uh, during a period where it was called the Great Schism, uh, there was a papacy in Avignon, as well as a papacy of the Vatican. Um, a different view, even though it's not in our area, is just to give you an idea, is this is Mont Blanc, which is France's highest mountain, just about under 15,000 feet. But as you can see, beyond the mountains, there's a whole variety of different smaller mountain plains and uh, valleys of various sorts, just lending to the diversity of France and, of course, the bounty of the land that's associated with it. Of course, now another example of France or why France is food. Now, I'm only going to show you this one picture, but I'm going to use it to make two points. First off, even though there are different regional cuisines throughout France, one common denominator, I'd say, is cheese. Um, cheeses of all varieties, at least 200, if not 300 uh, varieties of cheese from what I understand, goat, sheep, and milk, uh, cow milk cheese. Um, but of course, even though they're, like I said, different regional cuisine, the one common denominator in all of France are, is cheese. And the second point I wanted to make is partially uh, on account of this clerk. One thing I particularly like about the French arts people 
in spite of their um, reputation for being rude or impersonal, uh, they generally tend to be slow to open up, uh, different than Americans are. But once you make friends with them, with them they're friends for life, um, uh, which is a wonderful aspect. Uh, certainly in my relationships over the last 30 years with owners, with our staff, uh, with just French people and friends I've made in general. Um, so, and typically if you go to a store like here, you're gonna always say hello to the owner and you're always gonna say goodbye when you leave. That's common courtesy, something we don't see necessarily so much here in the States, but very much is a standard practice uh, in France just because of respect for um, between people effectively. I'm going to basically now move over to Provence. Uh, we're going to go to the Y Provence, um, but just to give you an idea of geography, uh, again, here's sort of one of our towns, uh, apparently Fontaine, where we have accommodations. Uh, and that's sort of, this is our general area here. Uh, as you can see, they start to get mountains to the, um, to the Northeast. I'm going to get a closer view. So here we're kind of like our base uh, in Provence. Uh, we have accommodations in Pern. We have accommodations in La Tour. We used to have accommodations uh, in Lille sur Sorgue, which we don't anymore, but Lille sur Sorgue is still sort of the base of the area, the largest town uh, in our immediate area. And very important, partially because it's got this fantastic Sunday market, both produce as well as antiques. Uh, Ile Chasseur being sort of the antique capital of the south of France, pretty much the biggest uh, antique place other than Paris itself. Um, another reason, of course, for Provence is the climate. Now, of course, everyone knows lavender and sunflowers, and that's a result of France, uh, Provence having a very hot dry climate, long summers, um, which leads to a lot of bounty of the land like lavender, Provence, uh, sunflowers, you have herbs de Provence, but then of course you also have various things that come from the land, um, uh, which of course results in Provence's cuisine. Now, these are olives being displayed at the market. Uh, Provence isn't as famous for its olives or its olive oil as, um, uh, as say Tuscany or uh, Andalusia or even Greece, for example, but their olive oil is a fantastic quality, just probably not something you can usually get. So certainly if you go to Provence, I would suggest you purchase some to bring home with you. Another example of cuisine in the market uh, are sausages. And I only point these out just because of uh, the variety. Uh, you probably can't necessarily read it, but uh, these are uh, sausages made with mushrooms called boletas. This is bull. This happens to have figs in it. And if you can read back here, it's chanterelles. Uh, so there's an interesting variety. And of course, all of this is just because of the bounty of the land, so to speak. But then again, uh, Provence also borders the Mediterranean. So there's a lot of seafood. Uh, and this is sort of the quintessential example being bouillabaisse, something you would typically eat, especially in Marseille. Uh, that's sort of its specialty. Uh, but of course, there are different other fish products and a lot of people eat instead of something complicated like this, just what they call fish soup, soup de poisson. Um, and then of course, another part of, that comes from the land is produce. Uh, obviously you can see some flowers and various produce. Uh, and by chance, this happens to be at the Ulster Sorg market. So you can only see scant view, but you can see that there are different other stalls and the market really much blankets almost most of the center of town. Um, hence another reason to visit. Now this is um, a, a, another uh, uh, product of the land, so to speak, is Provence's wine. Now you can see there are different regions and a lot of them have different specialties. Provence has a lot of rosés, in fact, maybe some of the best rosés I've ever had. Um, our general area is close to the Rhone Valley, which is well known for wines like Chateau Neuf de Pop, Chigondas, and Vaqueas. Um, we actually are in this area right here, which you can, we can see is not wine territory, but in fact, more produce. In fact, this particular town here, which is about maybe uh, 20 minutes south of Perrin Le Fontaine is called Cavagnon. And it is called the world's capital of melon. During peak season, it's probably the best thing you can possibly eat. Uh, the only thing that's odd, kind of odd is when they have too much, uh, they let them rot out in the fields. So when you're driving around near Cavignon, you get this sort of sickly sweet smell in the air that pervasive, um, but it's a sign that melons are in season. Uh, 
And of course, since we're not in a wine region, if you don't feel like going out to a winery, you can obviously visit this, uh, this uh, store in the Ulster Sorg to get your vin and liqueurs. Now, another reason for Provence, um, in fact, I'll only include this one photo, but it, this is the town of Gourde, which is associated with the Luberon mountain range. And I'm gonna guess that probably thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people have taken this exact same picture. And you can see why effectively, it's just a stunning uh, sight, a stunning view um, and just a beautiful place. And you can see obviously also great blue sky, which is typical of Provence. Um, in fact, one of the reasons why so many artists ended up going to the area is just because of this particular blueness of the sky. But then, of course, after eating and wine and uh, sightseeing, you need to come home somewhere. And so here we have one of our cottages in Provence called Le Jardin 1. Um, Le Jardin 1. Here is a Le Jardin 2. And these both are near the town of Le Tour, which is one of the towns I'd mentioned previously. Pardon? And then now we're gonna to pivot to Alsace. Alsace, of course, bordering the, um, uh, bordering the east um, of, uh, with Germany. These are the Vosges Mountains, which kind of present a sort of a block of sort of like almost a, 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 a sort of a, a barrier between Alsace and Lorraine, which is normally coupled together. People tend to say Alsace-Lorraine, but they're two very different territories. And certainly the Alsace region, in our view, is certainly one worth visiting. Um, this is all the wine route. Um, basically, I'll, I'll speak about Alsatian wines later, but um, this is where you have uh, mostly from the south of Colmar, almost near Mulhouse, Belouz, upwards almost to north of Strasbourg. And so you could say this is our base territory. Uh, and as you know, Alsace historically, uh, between the Thirty Years' War and World War II, has flipped back and forth several times. Uh, in fact, you can almost sort of joke, or they're uh, not exactly a joke, but if you're German, you tend to look to the west and think of the Vosges Mountains as being the border with France. Whereas if you're in France, looking eastwards, you see the Rhine River as being your border, uh, which is sort of indicative of how many times it's gone back and forth. But in the end, the Alsatians consider themselves French, but they're very tied to Germanic culture. Uh, you'll see in architecture and food as well. Um, so first off, going to cuisine. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is considered sort of one of these specialties of the Alsatian region. It's called choucroute. And although maybe not a pretty picture, basically gives you an idea of it's basically smoked meats garnished with potatoes and what looks to be sauerkraut. But in fact, French don't ferment their cabbage like the Germans do. It's cooked fresh with Riesling wine, juniper berries and various other spices and such. If you're invited to someone's house for choucroute, uh, unless you have a problem with uh, uh, the various smoked meats, I would certainly take, uh, take uh, up the invitation. Uh, I've actually been invited by one of our owners a long time ago, and it turned out to become a five hour dinner effectively. Um, so certainly if you're ever invited, don't, uh, don't hesitate to take advantage of it. Another food uh, that I like that's particular Alsace is tarte flambe or flamacouche. Um, Looks like a pizza and effectively kind of is, um, but it's base of creme fraiche, uh, onions and ham hock. Um, I have particularly fond memories because the first meal I ever had in Alsace, uh, I was with our founder, Hal, and my colleague, Ellen, who joined me in, in prospecting for our Alsace fun tour. Uh, we worked all day, got late, we forgot about dinner, went out to a restaurant. They said that, you know, that they weren't serving dinner anymore. But the woman said, uh, we can make you some tart flambés and a salad. And we were just so hungry and just so happy that we were, you know, very satisfied. And of course, tart flambé is still one of my favorite uh, uh, dishes. Uh, for anyone who happens to know Trader Joe's, they actually have in their frozen pizza section something they call the tart d'Alsace, which is sort of a representation of this. And of course, another part about Alsace are the vineyards. Um, now, Alsace is particular, whereas most of the wine regions in France tend to have varietals mixed in blends effectively, uh, like Chateau Neuf de Pop as Morvedre, Syrah, uh, and I forgot what else. Um, uh, whereas in Alsace, they tend to just use individual varietals. So you'll have Riesling, Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir, 
uh, Sylvaner, Gewürztraminer, and those are all individual grapes, rarely ever get mixed. Um, and uh, uh, I'll take you to just one example. As you can see, this is specifically a Riesling wine. Uh, mostly all white wine, the closest thing to a red would be the uh, uh, Pinot uh, Gris. Um, and it's not really red, it's kind of more of a, a tannish color. Now, this is more of a close-up of where we are. Um, so just to give you an idea of the patchwork that is uh, uh, Alsace, Alsace. And this is, of course, mostly vineyards for the most part. Some produce, but really Alsace is very much wine territory. As soon as you leave every village or any village, you're mostly going to go through vineyards effectively. Now, of course, one of the reasons to visit Alsace are scenic villages. This one specifically where we have one accommodation, it's a town of Ribeauville. Uh, as you can see, basically Germanic in many senses in terms of the architecture, half timbered houses, uh, these cute wrought iron signs. Uh, and you can't see them here probably because of the time of the year, but often flower boxes everywhere. And it's hard to see as well, but you can maybe uh, Kind of make out there's a castle up here north on a uh, to upward above uh, Ribeauville. This is one of the towns called the considered a gem in Alsace, the town of Rikbeer. You can then you can see the half timbered housing. Uh, you can see places where there would be flowers for flower boxes. Um, and one particular thing about Rikbeer is for some reason a lot of the houses are painted either blue or yellow, uh, which makes for very colorful and uh, just lovely atmosphere. Uh, certainly worth a visit for sure. Another place worth visiting, Colmar. As you can see, uh, half timbered architecture. In this case, time of year allows for flowers. Uh, specifically, this section of Colmar is called Little Venice, La Petite Venice, uh, mostly just because of the canals. Uh, two things to note about Colmar. One is there's a museum called the Unterlinden, which has probably one of the greatest masterpieces of altar, of, of, of church architecture, but it's an altar piece called the Isenheim uh, altar piece. Uh, Colmar also happens to be the hometown of Frederick Bartholdi, who happened to design the Statue of Liberty. And in fact, there is a miniature Statue of Liberty in the town of Colmar itself. Um, but of course, the fact that Fran I, uh, going back to France and us, the United States, obviously we long been allies. And of course, that's one of the expressions of the fact that France has been big fans of the United States, just this gift from them of the Statue of Liberty. And then, of course, up to eating, sightseeing and such, here we have, this is the outside uh, of the house. And I partly like this just because even though we don't work during the Christmas season, obviously you can tell this is Christmas time. And Alsatians take Christmas and especially their markets very seriously. Uh, one of the great things about visiting off season, if there's ever an opportunity, are the Christmas markets. Certainly more representative and Alsatianized better than the ones you find in Germany. Now I'm going to circle back to Paris. And why Paris? Well, first I'll describe one thing about Paris, which I try to tell most people. Paris, in spite of its largeness or grandeur in terms of history and culture, is a relatively small city. It's only about um, seven miles across at its widest point, sort of like a lopsided sideways oval with an even more lopsided frown across the face carved by the Seine River. Uh, so just so that you know, Everything south of the Seine is the left bank. Everything north of the Seine is the right bank. And as, as you can see, there's a few little monuments that you could see here. Arc de Triomphe is noted, the Musée Rodin, the Louvre, and Place de la Bastille. Well, of course, I'm just gonna give you little snapshots of some of the uh, history and culture in Paris. This being the Sacré Coeur, which is new in most terms uh, architecturally since it was consecrated just after World War I. Effectively, we're sort of like France coming back to life after the world of the First World War. Another little piece is uh, Sorbonne. Paris has always been an intellectual center and Sorbonne has always been one of the most prestigious universities in uh, in all of Europe, actually. Another example of just history, this being uh, Paris's oldest planned square called the Place de Vosges in the Marais district, one of my favorite areas of the city. Um, 
as you can see, there are these lovely sort of arcades, which you can walk under either for shopping or the restaurants that are offered, or just to uh, hide yourself from the rain in case it does rain. Another interesting piece is this uh, bridge called the Pont Alexander III, Alexander III. Uh, you can see it leads up to what's called Les Invalides. Used to be a former military hospital, now mostly a museum of things military. And if you can see the globe, the, the sort of dome, the golden dome, underneath that is uh, where uh, Napoleon's sarcophagus lies. I can't remember, to be honest, if he's actually buried there, but he has this fantastic red marble sarcophagus, which is worth visiting, certainly, and especially Les Invalides in general, if you're interested in military history. Another reason for Paris, museums. Uh, this is sort of a stylized picture of the pyramid, the Grand Pyramid, that is uh, sort of now the main entrance to the Louvre Museum. Uh, those of you who do go to Paris, uh, we include a museum pass, two days for a week, uh, two two-day passes for um, uh, for two weekers. Uh, basically, it's a, a 48 hour pass. So basically, you can just start, say, Monday or Tuesday afternoon, go to the museum, Wednesday, go to the museum, and then you still have Thursday morning to use your remaining pass time. Another museum. Okay, no. So I'll, sorry, I figure I'd actually show you the Louvre itself, since, of course, it's huge. And this is the pyramid that we saw. And as you can see, pretty much the entire collection runs all through here, which is why the Louvre can literally take days if you really want to visit. But I think most people tend to get tired after a few hours. Another museum, another stylized picture, this being of the Musée Rodin, another a museum that's covered by the museum pass. Uh, and certainly most everyone knows the thinker, but frankly, Rodin, in my opinion, certainly has much, much better art. I mean, it's a great sculpture, but there's so many other great things that Rodin has done uh, in terms of sculpture. Another reason for Paris is food. Now, Paris doesn't specifically have its own cuisine per se, but much like with transportation where all roads lead to Paris, eventually all cuisines arrive in Paris. So you can get a good idea of the various regional cuisine uh, in France by going to various restaurants in Paris. But of course, Paris has modernized. You'll certainly find things you used to not find 30 years ago, like sushi, uh, fusion, that sort of thing. Uh, but of course, certainly there are so many restaurants in Paris and you're certainly never going to exhaust your potential options. But if you choose not to have uh, your dessert with uh, your dinner at the restaurant, you can always stop in at the patisserie and take advantage of the fact that you have a refrigerator and a house to, or an apartment where you can uh, enjoy your own dessert. And one thing about Paris, you get, most folks know it is a very romantic city. And although maybe these don't look romantic, uh, this sort of bridge called the Bridge of Love, really the Bridge of Arts, uh, they became sort of, this sort of tradition where uh, couples would put their names on the locks, lock them to the gate, so to speak, of the fencing for the bridge. Unfortunately, because of the weight of all these locks, they had to stop letting people do that. But they have kept the locks that are there preserved, uh, just so that people get an idea of how cute and important this actually is to some people. And then last but not least, same thing, after food and dessert and wine and uh, sightseeing, you need a place to stay. Uh, this one happens to be one of our apartments called the Champs-Élysées One. Uh, as you can see, the owner has a thing with books. Uh, luckily, they're in French and in English. So at least you have a, a library to take advantage of while you're uh, in Paris. Another apartment, uh, just one more, is this called the Orleans apartment, Orléans. Uh, it's on the Ile Saint-Louis, so a very prime location and a, not surprisingly very popular as well. Now, last but not least, uh, why on tours? Um, well, uh, between myself and say our staff person like Vivian here in, um, uh, in Alsace, uh, we know France pretty well. In some cases, not all, but you'll be met at the airport, typically Vivian in Alsace and our um, uh, staff person Anne in Provence uh, meets folks at the airport at specific times. We also have an orientation session the day after your arrival. And usually there's some event, be it a meal, uh, a wine tasting, an outing, um, depending on the specific destination. 
This is a post-orientation picture, post-orientation dessert. These were for two first-timers in Paris this year. Uh, one of the few folks who got in early, so to speak, uh, and were, uh, became one of the first waves of untours who went this year finally back to France. And then, of course, this is an example of a potential wine tasting. Our staff person in Provence, Anne, happens to be a wine expert and has often led tours. And people have also um, used her services to guide and drive you around since after a certain amount of wine, you certainly don't want to be driving at all. Now, of course, the untours include transportation. In the case of Alsace and Provence, a car. Uh, and the Renault Clio, for many of you, might be familiar if you've driven in uh, France, uh, since that seems to be a very common car in car rental fleets. But if you're in Paris, you're certainly not going to drive. Uh, luckily, the metro system, once you get the hang of it, very easy to use, very comprehensive, uh, and very thorough in terms of uh, getting from point A to point B and all over the city. If you happen to combine Paris with Alsace or Paris with Provence, your connection between the two would be done by the TGV. Uh, most people are familiar. Uh, a lot of you probably haven't been on one, but it goes about 180 miles an hour, which is something that most people have never experienced before. Uh, so a great ride, uh, certainly if you ever get to take it. And of course, last but not least, these are the staff I've been referring to. Anne Plom in Provence uh, happened to be in Avignon with this little half bridge um, that was never finished for some reason in the middle of the, uh, the river. And again, this is Vivian Belair uh, in Alsace. And then our main staff person in Provence, uh, in Paris, is Francoise, with, of course, one of her favorite buildings in mind, Notre Dame, behind her. And then, of course, even though things have certainly gotten better from a COVID standpoint, we're still offering COVID support if and when needed. Uh, certainly, right now, we're monitoring changing requirements. And as you might know, that you no longer need a negative test either to enter France or to return to the US. Um, pretty much you just need proof of vaccination. Um, and then of course our on-site staff will keep you abreast of any relevant local information just in case things do change. And another reason for why UNTOURS is the un UNTOURS is owned by the UNTOURS Foundation. There is no individual owner of the company. Uh, the UNTOURS Foundation basically loans money to businesses that would often have difficulty getting capital in the regular markets. So, and so they support sustainable small businesses to create good jobs, of course, and just, just more equity in general. Um, this happens to be Elizabeth Kilo, who's co-CEO of the foundation itself. And that's pretty much it for this presentation. Uh, I wanted to uh, at least note to you folks that if you book by July 6th, there's a 10% discount on any untour in 2022. But you better plan soon, uh, just because availability might be limited soon. Um, other than that, I thank you for your time. I hope at least <laughs> my presentation was OK and that you learned maybe a little something. And I'll leave it now on to Brian. Okay, thanks, Dodge. Um, so now we can um, have some questions if uh, anyone would like to ask. I'm going to just, uh, oh, okay, somebody's raising their hand. I'm going to just go to gallery mode real quick here. Let me um, do that. And I'm going to unspotlight Dodge so we can see everybody. All right. Rory, actually, um, so with such a small group, I'm fine just um, with raising your hand and uh, just maybe turning your camera on and, and your mic on and, and going, going ahead and asking a question. So go ahead, Rory. Um, I do not want to drive. Uh, if I was to go to Provence, uh, other than providing me with an apartment, is on tours the right match for me in terms of helping me get around? Or would you say, if you don't, if you're not willing to drive uh, a car we provide, find another company to work with. Unfortunately, uh, Rory, it's very difficult to get around without a car. 
Um, public transportation in the area is relatively meager. And of course, even if you're in a town, it doesn't mean that there's any connections elsewhere. So it is disappointing in some respects, but Provence is really one of those places you almost absolutely have to have a car unless a private driver can be found. And I do know that that is very expensive. So it doesn't really maybe help with uh, your, your hope to get to Provence, but you know, we'd rather be honest about the fact that it is almost really difficult, if not impossible, to get around and sightsee without a car. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Jerry uh, Kay asked us a question. Um, there was a planned special week in Provence that included tours of Impressionist sites. Uh, this did not happen. Any thoughts of putting that together again? I'm actually just going to look. I don't think we have that, or no, do we? We do not have it planned for next year. Uh, only the wine and food week that we yeah. uh, do in the fall. Um, uh, obviously, this year was supposed to happen, and I think last year as well. But unfortunately, uh, we haven't put it back together again. Uh, I believe the difficulty might now be the person who actually conducts the um, the tour and the lectures and such availability. She's been in the United States actually for quite some time. So unfortunately, not even available to uh, to do these art tours. Right. OK, so but we we'd love to do it again. Uh, we'd love to start that again. It, COVID hit it just just as we were starting that that program and it just never happened. And yeah, but it is on the list of things we'd like to try again. Um, James is asking, when will early 2023 tours open? Uh, some of them are. Paris is always going to be a laggard just because there are some issues with apartments and uh, anti-Airbnb laws. Uh, Provence uh, will have some open, uh, not all accommodations. Some owners are waiting, uh, but a good chunk of our um, tours are open now. And probably by Labor Day, which is often the traditional time we start offering the next year, should be available by then. Okay. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions? Rory, is your hand up again or is it just still up? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. I, I didn't raise my hand, but I do have another question. Um, <laughs> okay. That's my first one. Okay, so Provence may not be the right uh, match with on tours, but if I, I love Paris, I've been there before. Uh, you would find me an apartment to stay in in Paris, uh, <laughs> right? Well, we keep, yeah, we sort of keep a regular roster of apartments. Unfortunately, the apartments come and go. As I mentioned, the, this, uh, there's an anti-Airbnb law that was actually enacted in Paris right before the pandemic in 2019. And they kind of wreak havoc on uh, vacation rental supply. Uh, obviously, the French government's looking to encourage people to do long-term rentals for residents because they have a housing shortage. Uh, so we've had apartments that we've lost, and we're always looking for more. Or, but currently, whatever we have would be on our website. Yeah. So, so Rory, one one thing you could do is look at the apartments that we have available for 2022. If you see one that you like and um, you have a date in mind for next year, uh, just shoot us an email, and Dodge can put you on a waiting list for an apartment for next year. Um, obviously, there's no guarantee that, that that place will be available next year, but we're also not going to ask for a deposit until we actually have it on our uh, on our website and we have a contract for it. So that's what we recommend with any untour that's not ready quite yet. Okay, just one short question and then I'll let others talk. Uh, besides providing a, an apartment match, what else am I paying for when I sign up for Paris on tours? Um, uh, with oh, sorry. Um, well, with Paris, uh, and much would like all, all of our on tours, um, there's at least help with getting you to your accommodation. In Paris specifically, uh, when you arrive at Charles de Gaulle Airport, our staff person meets you, connects you with our driving service to bring you to your apartment. And then there's somebody usually there at the apartment to show you around. Uh, the day after your arrival, there's an orientation session and the event that we invite you to that I mentioned. And then of course, there's ground transportation in the form of metro transportation, because really that's all you'll need for Paris. And we include this uh, um, museum pass that I mentioned. And then of course, uh, during your stay, if you have any questions, problems or emergencies, our staff is there effectively 
monthly. That's part of the support service, if you want to call it. Um, and of course, then we bring you back to the airport, or the train station, depending on what your plans are after your Parasun tour. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay, Jerry has another question. Uh, I'm just curious, where do you fly into if you're only doing the Provence tour? Uh, and, and what sort of a, arrangements otherwise are possible before and after if you're doing mostly Provence? Uh, Marseille Airport is the main airport that you fly in and out of. Uh, and typically, if you arrive by, I think, two in the afternoon, two to three, our staff person, Ann, would meet you there, at least help you with your car rental. You'd still drive your own way to your accommodation, um, but she would sort of be there to sort of uh, uh, guide you uh, onward, so to speak. Um, as for before and after, it kind of depends. Since we everything we do with Untours is on a weekly basis, we do have some people who do travel in other parts of France, hotel stays or whatever. Uh, and of course, if they need transportation to say Avignon, which is where you would normally take a train into to get your car rental, we would set up your car rental there. But again, typically if you're flying in and out of, uh, uh, for just the Provence on tour, it would be Marseille Airport. Does that answer the question, Jerry? Okay. Oh, Jerry's on mute. All right. Yes. Yes, thank, thank you. Okay, I'm, welcome. I'm on my phone, so it's in a coffee shop, so it's sort of hard to get in and out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Um, any other questions? Good. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us. We're going to yeah. send you a, um, uh, a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this uh, this um, presentation that you just saw. So if you came in late, you can hear what you missed. If you have a friend that you'd like to share it with, you can do that. Um, otherwise, um, thanks a lot. Thank you, Dodge. Good job. Um, Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Uh, all right. Take care, everyone. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Bien fait.